What up, everybody, and welcome back to another episode of the Nudging Report. I'm your host, Pablo, and joining me, as always, is Mr. Brian Schultz. Brian, Disney box office continues to suffer. There was one point, Brian, where I was like, when Disney was making their plans for Disney Plus and all that stuff, I'm like, oh, I'm going to buy Disney with all this stuff that's coming out. I would have been hugely disappointed in that bet. A very disappointing year for Disney thus far in the box office, Brian, where they at one point were dominating. Total domination. Now, the complete reverse. Your thoughts, Brian, on the issues Disney is having at the box box office, and then we'll get into uh, another disappointment. Your thoughts. So, it's it is in some senses a, a matter of, of perspective. Um, Disney still is the number one studio in the world. Um, it still has the highest market share of, of global box office year to date, even this year, I think it's about 37%. But they are losing money on a lot of the projects to get there. To put in perspective what Pablo is talking about on the eve of Disney Plus launching, <laughs> why we talk about the billion dollars threshold why we got so spoiled. Disney alone in the year 2019 had seven movies go above 1 billion in box office. Led by, of course, Avengers Endgame, which got close to 3 billion in box office. So in a 12 month span, they basically had seven movies making them an average of like a billion dollars a month if you want to just take the total. That's ridiculous. <laughs> And we saw no reason that it would slow down. And yet here we are. So the issue we're starting to see, and what's interesting is we're now getting some clarity on some budgets for some projects that have already come out. And I am consistently shocked at how much Disney is spending to make these movies. So Doctor Strange, The Multiverse of Madness, almost got to a billion dollars last year 950 million dollars worldwide so it made money but at the time the reported budget on the film was 150 to 200 million dollars which was pretty standard for marvel shang chi yeah. for example confirmed at 150 million uh, not not six months earlier it's since come out that because we know that movie was kind of changed directors and they did a lot of reshoots the actual budget before marketing was 300 million dollars which kind of underscores, considering how sloppy parts of that movie looked visually, like that's a disaster. So 300 million plus you figure they marketed at least 100. The movie made money, but like it went into the box office probably needing to be 750 to eight worldwide to break even. So now 950 is like, yeah, you've made a little bit of money, but not like real bad. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Which means that movie was more expensive than Endgame, which is absurd. But then you fast forward and you start seeing the pattern of like, okay, all the Marvel movies were going north of 200. Little Mermaid, 200. And then we hear, we'll talk about Indiana Jones 5. Indiana Jones 5, back to 300. Like, Pablo, when you're green lighting numbers like that, your starting point for success is so high. That is a lot of arrogance, quite honestly, that like people are just going to show up because the king, because the, the, the castles on the, on the logo. Certainly, Brian. I have to ask you, Brian, or, or not, not, I have to comment rather on the multiverse of madness. The expectation, Brian, for that movie was big i was i was expecting that movie to be over a billion dollars because of what we were expecting the multiverse of madness to be it wasn't what it we thought it was no and it's the word of mouth for that is horrendous i don't care what nobody says you You can't defend it So I, I, I would, you know, I expected it to be, and it's, and the fact that it, it was what it was, 
and it may what it may, that is on the tail end going down of the hype for the MCU because that movie comes out now, it is a disaster. Correct, a hundred percent. And it does make me wonder, granted, as I said, that was a troubled production with the director change, but where exactly did the money go? Like the idea that visually that movie is twice what say, you know, Shang-Chi or even like more than twice of like what Captain America Winter Soldier was like eight years earlier. That's ridiculous. I, I I understand there's been some inflation in the last decade. Totally get that. Not enough to justify that. And not enough to justify what we got on screen visually, which is, you know, the VFX thing was still kind of in its early days, but that movie's sloppy. Like go back and watch parts of that movie. It's very sloppy, yeah. like what they show you in the multiverse. So it, it just speaks to like Disney has to fundamentally rethink what they're greenlighting and how they're achieving the product that's on screen. So I'll give you a comparison, which I think is really interesting. This really is a Disney problem. So I went and looked and I said, okay, if it's inflation, everyone would have it, right? Every studio would have it. Mm -hmm. So someone explained to me, oh, I didn't even throw Elemental in there, by the way, $200 million budget on Elemental. So explain to me how Elemental costs $200 million, but Super Mario Brothers costs $100 million. How? Super Mario Brothers? How much did it make? Super Mario Brothers? It's $1.3 billion in climbing. But at $100 million, the break even point is only about four hundred million after marketing. So that's giving yourself real margin for error. And the second this thing opened the way it did, Universal's like cash register, right? <laughs> but at $100 million, you are protecting yourself on the downside. Why is Disney greenlighting $200 million for a Pixar movie? Like, why does it take $200 million? Now, the Marvel movies, I get why they were getting like at least 150 to two with the success they had, but why three? Like, why are we up at three? Why is Indiana Jones getting three? How is that? Like, so that basically means that Indiana Jones had to do $800 million worldwide to break even. That was a starting point. Are we going to get there? We're not going to get halfway there. Uh, as I walk during the, during the week, uh, you know, I watch a lot of M MSNBC, uh, Squawk Box and all these other, you know, it's on in the background. And I read a headline, uh, Amazon is supposed to have some discussions about the budgets for the studios. Mm -hmm. Given what you just said about some of these budgets, Brian, and what you've just learned, our head's gonna roll. I know one that's gonna roll. <laughs> and how soon I would, I would, that I would suspect that after we get things back to normal with regards to production and getting back to uh, the point where we're creating content again, will, uh, will we see the effect of budgets go way down because of what was because of what is happening right now. Yes, I, I think that Disney is in the process of figuring that out. But I do think with the strikes, one of the things that's going to be sorted out is budgets are going to be cut dramatically because they have to be. The math has to work, right? So yeah. I use the the Mario Brothers example. I went back and looked. Like Universal, very consistently for its animated features like Despicable Me, they they basically cap at a hundred million dollars. Like that's their standard, right? So Disney basically is like 200, they're 100. So immediately, right, that's a huge thing. Here's the other one that blew my mind. The budget for Oppenheimer is $100 million. Like with the cast that is in that movie and the reports that there are, Z well, I guess what saved him money is he said there's not a single CGI shot in the movie, but he shot the entire thing on IMAX and he recreated an atomic blast in real life. And he only spent $100 million. <laughs> Oppenheimer is one of those movies where you tell these stars. And I remember Eddie Murphy saying, funny shmoney. 
they told him, forget about the money. Do this. Fair. Because this is, this is something uh, people are going to appreciate create, uh, creatively wise and, and, and what people are going to witness in terms of that production. And Oppenheimer is one of those films where you just don't pass up, A, working with Christopher Nolan and perhaps hearing the pitch of that film to these individuals whom he wants in his film, how are they going to say no? They'll take whatever, because after that, the money's going to, it's cha-ching, you know, after that. They're going to be casting different. They're going to be doing it. This is just the jumping off point I agree. for them. I mean, he, he has unique clout probably with, with, with talent at this point. But it speaks to, look, that means, again, that's another universal movie. It's just interesting to me that you have a studio which basically is limiting itself. The only movie that Universal really broke the bank for didn't work out for them. That was Fast X. That was another $300 million budget movie that, you know, is going to do 600, 700 worldwide. It's not going to make money. First time in a long time, a fast movie really hasn't been in the green um, or in the black firmly. So I just think those days are kind of going to shift away. Uh, I think you're going to have contracts that move they're really going to try to emphasize back end right they're going to have everyone aligned and like the budgets will only really balloon if the box office is there to justify it and like i even looked at like you know transformers is not a movie that had a lot of big name actors in it but visually i thought they were it was very successful like i thought the effects it's some interesting articles about what they did to make the transformers yes. look good i think they look good like that budget is a little bit south of 200 million dollars so it proves to me that you can make a very cgi heavy visually impressive film without going over the $200 million mark. So why Disney is just cool handing out 300 million, especially <clears throat> Indiana Jones, which we'll talk about. That's, I think that's over. I think Bob Iger is in the process yeah, of just going sorry. through and saying, we are just cutting numbers across the board now and you guys can figure it out. Certainly. And that's what they've been uh, lacking that, 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 that mindset of figuring things out and trying to make a profit on these films instead of just pushing things out, thinking that people are just going to come and see these films and you're going to just make, been making money. You spoiled them, everybody. And, and you spoiled, they spoiled themselves into thinking that that was going to happen. And look at it now. People are just like, and I'm sorry, the good stuff is going to probably get lost in some of that sauce because, you know, it, 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 it's movies like Maverick, Oppenheimer, Barbie, I think Super Mario. Hit, by the way, I think Barbie's going to be a big hit. I'm telling you, this is this is this thing is turning into what from the '80s or from from the past can we bring back? Yep. Don't be surprised if we see here He Man. His name. I'll be oh, surprised. He said it. Mattel, now they've been trying to do He Man forever. We know that. I know. But Mattel said. The Mattel universe, if Barbie hits, the Mattel universe is ready. And Masters of the Universe obviously is one of their highest profile projects. It's sitting there again. They want to do it again. Yeah, there you go. And I'm going to put myself out there right now. If you give me the opportunity to do a Voltron movie, I'm going to make that joint dope. <laughs> I will see that like five times in the theater. Um, but if they do it. Yes. Uh... Indy 5, Brian. I heard some good things about it, Brian. I, I actually did hear some good things yep. about it. You saw it twice. Yep. Um, but what, from what I've been hearing, the box office and what you already said, that the box office hasn't been really doing what it what they thought, what it, they thought it was going to do. And the money that they spent, this is going to be a disaster, perhaps the way out, out of Kennedy. Yep. And that has been a uh, that people have been discussing that quite a bit, Brian. Your thoughts on the movie and what you think the ramifications of this disappointment will be? <laughs> yeah, look, I, I count I count myself in the camp of I went in with a lowered bar, and I was pleasantly surprised. This movie is considerably better in my estimation than Kingdom of the Crystal Skull. Um, it is definitely not anywhere near the level of Raiders of the Lost Ark or Last Crusade, so don't worry. that That's safe. But I think for the most part, this was a very successful send-off to Harrison Ford as, as Indiana Jones. I think 
what was interesting to me in watching this was, you know, I, James Mangold, who is we're going to hear from, because in theory he's doing Swamp Thing and he's doing um, a Star Wars or like origin movie, basically of the Force, if this ever gets off the ground. My 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 ten cents on on James Mangold is that his floor is very high. Like if James Mangold is directing a movie, chances are it's not going to be bad. And I feel like that was the case here. It was almost like watching a protege of Steven Spielberg do Steven Spielberg for two and a half hours. Like there's some scenes where you're like, I know it's not Spielberg shooting this, but Mangold's doing a pretty good job of making me think that it is. Mm-hmm. And it's very true to the spirit of, of some of Indy's best chases, like the truck horse chase in Raiders of the Lost Ark or, or so forth. I think the, shockingly, I thought the de-aging tech was actually pretty good in this movie. I actually really? thought the young Harrison Ford, 90% of the shots look pretty believable. There's a few like motion shots where you can definitely see like almost see the face tech, like as he as he's moving, but a lot of the close ups, like there's a whole sequence on a train. I was like, this looks a lot better than I thought it was gonna look. Mm-hmm. So I give them a lot of credit for doing that. <clears throat> I think where the movie stalls for me is in the finale. So I, I think I'm allowed to put some spoilers in here. Pablo gave me permission. So this is not a spoiler free review. Most people not- were saying that the, the 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 third act was was weak. So they went for something very big in the sense of, you know, obviously the Dial of Destiny is a time device. It's a time machine of some kind. But they kind of had a spin on it in the sense that it's not a time machine that lets you go back to any point in time. It kind of only brings you back to a certain point in time. And they opted to, the swing is, they opted to basically bring Indiana Jones and the villains back to 214 B.C., (laughs) And he oh, wow. literally comes face to face with Archimedes. So I and it's supposed to represent, I think, like Indiana Jones's lifelong quest to understand history. He literally meets this, you know, legendary historical figure, and that's supposed to bring him kind of full circle. I don't think that really worked. And the reason I don't and I think, but I think they were trapped by the story device. I think what this movie was kind of honestly setting up, but they probably talked about it and were like, we will get killed if we do this. I actually think what it was really setting up was them to go back in time into Indiana Jones's own history. But I think they felt like if they did that, it would have become too much of a back to the future and back to the future part two ripoff. But I actually think the way you'll see, like if you watch the first two acts, the way the story is progressing it definitely would lead you to, if they were going back in time, they would go back into time into Raiders of the Lost Ark, except the new villain would be trying to effectively steal the Ark and Indy would be trying to stop him while avoid coming into contact with his old self. That, which obviously is Back to the Future. But I actually think like if we were bringing it full circle because Marion's presence is very much felt throughout this movie, even though she's not a big part in it, that would have been the way to make the story circular but they probably yeah. couldn't do it. So then they went for this huge historical swing that I just don't think really works. And quite honestly, the scene doesn't look that great. Like the movie looks okay, I think in the first two thirds where they're kind of grave robbing and doing like classic indie stuff. But then you're like, I'm seeing like ancient Roman ships and like soldiers on a beach and Archimedes himself. And I just don't, you don't really buy it. It just kind of feels very staged. Um, and so I think that's what kind of keeps this movie in the end from kind of even reaching, I would say Temple of Doom levels, but certainly keeps it way away from, from Last Crusade and, and, and Raiders of the Lost Ark. But all in all, it's like, I had a good time. And like the movie goes pretty fast and Harrison Ford is, he's better in this movie than he was in the last one. He definitely is like doing more things and he's more engaged. Phoebe Waller-Bridge I thought was good. They did not overtly make her the new indie, which I thought was mm-hmm. good. Like it's hinted at, but they didn't do it like as blatantly as they did with Shia LaBeouf in the, in the last one. Um, who, by the way, going to our point about Disney destroying the MCU, um, big uh, spoiler alert in case you cared, Shia LaBeouf's character is dead in this movie, literally <laughs> killed, dead. After they explained wow. his absence by saying he was killed in service. Um, so yes, you can destroy storylines, uh, no problem. But the problem, Pablo, is the money. 
So I mean, like the story is fine. Like I would say, yeah, if you haven't seen it yet, I would say you'd have you'd have a pretty good time for two two and a half hours, especially if you like indie. But um, the issue is not enough people cared about this character anymore, and that I think will spell the end for Kathleen Kennedy finally. I don't see a reason for Disney to want to keep her around. I'm pretty sure. Disney is just not going to let her go empty handed. They're going to let her go perhaps in peace. That movie though, Brian, um, although Mangold uh, was um, directing this film, this movie doesn't make uh, a, a money. I don't think it'll deter them from wanting to have him helm this possible uh origin of the force because it's a very interesting idea and with i think they are on the verge of uh, reinvigorating that idea of the force in star wars again brian and that movie has a lot of potential i wouldn't mind seeing it yeah so i mean i think as we said the movie itself entertaining the financial results disastrous uh so indie opens with you know, the low end of estimates which themselves had kind of come down into the release but about 60 opening weekend was about 60 million domestic 130 million worldwide you know if you use kind of conventional math that means this movie will kind of end up probably 350 maybe you know 350 million total worldwide while well, the budget's 300 and the marketing was over 100. So they needed uh -huh. 800. So they're going to lose potentially more than $400 million on this movie. Mm -hmm. I cannot see Kathleen Kennedy surviving a loss of that magnitude. I don't care how much the movie is generally well received by people who did see it. Mm -hmm. um, you know, who knows when the de when the axe will fall, but I think it will come sooner than later, especially when you consider that, you know, we're talking about Star Wars and the reinvention, but you know, we haven't had a Star Wars movie since 2019. We haven't had a Star Wars movie that kind of was unilaterally liked since 2015. And that in and of itself was basically a remake of New Hope. Um, Star Wars TV ratings have taken a sizable nosedive with The Mandalorian in, in the most recent season. I think we're excited for Ashoka. I think we're excited for um, the Acolyte in particular, but the, you know, the reality is the momentum for the Star Wars product is just not there right now. This is not yeah. something that um, is captivating audiences. And what else is Lucasfilm? I mean, like, it's games, I guess. But, like, if the movie part's not in existence or is losing money and the TV part is kind of slipping or doesn't have enough volume to justify its existence, then, like, yeah, how are you not changing out the head of Lucasfilm at this point? And so... That then goes to, I agree with you, the mangled idea is interesting, but if Kathleen Kennedy goes, I think you have to assume that all of the ideas that she had greenlighted are going to be re-reviewed. So his his idea may not actually come to pass. And I certainly don't think that Ray movie is going to happen if, if Ken Kennedy's let go before the end of this year. But that origin film of the, of the Force is an interesting, a universally interesting idea across the board, especially, again... With them wanting to uh, reinvigorate interest in the Jedi, and 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 that whole idea, so I I I still think that idea still has uh, legs. And I think a show but, will do that to the oh. extent people watch the show, like the interest in like it'll it'll do more for Jedi. Yes, than Obi Wan did because it's freed of the Obi Wan Vader original trilogy kind of um, and prequel trilogy uh, handcuffs. How soon do you expect the announcement soon after or sometime after uh, the announcement of given uh, uh, Filoni and, and 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 this guy, what's his name? Favreau. Favreau. The, the, the keys. Yeah, I, I mean, I think it's before the end of the year. I mean, I think before the end of the year, Kathleen Kennedy is out and I think Filoni is going to be made the head of Lucasfilm. That would be my that would be my guess at this point. I just don't see. I mean, how did how does someone not get held accountable? If nothing else, for for a three hundred million dollar budgeted indie film, um, 
like the last one wouldn't have made money with a budget that high like and, you know, so yeah. i just yeah i just can't see her escaping a, a mark like that but but uh but yeah i mean disney's got a lot of re- disney's got a lot of rethinks and, and like i said the, the the tough part is yeah we've talked about the marvel problems a lot they haven't had like a really critically acclaimed project in a while i mean guardians was you know well regarded i would say well kind of forever well regarded but you know, ever since Endgame, there really hasn't been there really hasn't been a movie. I guess you unless you include No Way Home, which I always give half credit to Sony and, and Marvel for that. But um, yeah, we really haven't had that that event Marvel project. And like I said, we haven't had a Star Wars movie that everyone liked since Force Awakens, which was in itself a rehash. That's a long time. Yeah. One thing we can be sure of, Brian, and all of you out there can be sure of. That the only person that is uh, happy about these box office failures is The Rock. <laughs> you damn, you you better believe it. He is defending my movie. Didn't didn't wasn't the biggest flop of the year. You, you definitely can hear him talking that up. Um, but let us know in the comment section below what you guys think of. Uh, all that is transpiring with Lucas Films. Did you guys see Indy? What did you guys think of Indy? I haven't seen it. I, 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 you've made me think about going to see it, Brian. I just don't know when. Let's see how long it lasts in the theaters or how soon they announce they're going to be put in the streaming service. Because if it's soon, I would. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing. I mean, if you told me, do I have to see it on the big screen? Meh. Like I wouldn't, I wouldn't pitch you that, you know, like I think part of the problem is we've seen a lot of these movies, the blockbuster movies have struggled. It's a very competitive marketplace right now. You have to really grab people to get them to go. And like really the last movie, the only movie that did that in the May, June, in the really the June timeframe was Spider-Verse, but that had the kids, the animating got the kids out. And, you know, and obviously yeah, that that's an element that Super Mario had as well. Well, the adults get their time because Mission Impossible is coming, and that movie is going to get people. Oh, um, oh yeah, yeah, that's so, a billion. I, I agree. I think that one is a lock for a billion. I think it's going to hold very well, even with Oppenheimer and Barbie, which I think are both going to do well at their respective kind of budget points. I think Mission Impossible is the last true blockbuster of the year. That's my pick because I don't think there's anything really coming in the back half of the year that is anywhere close. I certainly think, Brian, that uh, movie going is going to pick up because of these films. And they won't be led by the by the superhero genre, Brian, which has been uh, the one thing that's been keeping the, the, the uh, I guess, the movie theaters going and the whole movie business going. And interesting. It's by the way, have you seen the Mission Impossible reviews? I've I've heard I've listened to some reviews from people whom I respect their their opinion and they said um, the story is a little bit iffy but the the action is is everything you ever wanted. So I mean, obviously Rotten Tomatoes is not everything, but ninety eight percent. Sheesh. The Stalkers did 97 on Maverick and now comes back with 98 on this movie. Yo, there's, there's a reason why people be going and telling him that you saved the movie industry from the superhero genre. I said this a long time ago. Tom Cruise single-handedly destroyed the superhero <laughs> genre. Chris Lauren was trying to do it, and now he's gotten his second chance with Oppenheimer. <laughs> it's crazy, yo. It's crazy. But let us know in the comment section below what you guys think of all this. Um, Brian, I have to say, Brian, I'm fatigued out. I don't care. Before we, before we go, we have the Marvels. We have Craven the Hunter. Blue what else do we have? Blue Beetle. Aquaman 2. And Aquaman 2. Exactly. Which will be the movie that bombs? So far, it's been The Flash, correct? Are we, uh, yeah. Is that biggest, disapp- biggest financial disappointment is The Flash, 100%. Will it stay at number one? Oh. 
No, I think the Marvels. I think the Marvels got this. Wow. Okay. I think the Marvels. I think got Aquaman. This. I think Aquaman. Uh, Be, I, 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 and I know, and I, I understand why you would say that Aquaman has a chance because of perhaps Jason Moore. Am I, am I right? And I just think the built-in goodwill of the first one and James Wan, Asia, like I just think there's a little better chance that like that opening okay. weekend, that there's not much else this year at, at, at Christmas. Okay. You know, had, okay. they, had they done it last year opposite Avatar, it would have felt different. But this year it's it's open for them. Whereas I just think that based on what we're hearing, the Marvel's budget, that might actually be like two fifty or three. So that's why I'm just like that's what I'm saying, with what we're spining out. And if that's the case, I think this is a movie that could, similar to indie, be like three fifty, four hundred million dollar global, and you're like, that's like a two hundred, three hundred million dollar loss. And like, I just don't know that Aquaman is going to lose that much money. We'll see, we'll see. Be very, be very interesting. Um, yeah, let us know in the comment section below. I think next time, Brian, we'll talk about uh, what Mr. Simu Liu spoke of uh, recently regarding Shang Chi two. Uh, uh, wasn't a big fan of Shang Chi one because I thought it was going to be something different. You enjoyed Brian Shang Chi. Um, I've always said that Shang Chi for me was just Jackie Chan movie in in, in the MCU. That's that's how I, I looked at because to me Shang Chi is master of kung fu. There wasn't there wasn't none of that for me, you know. Uh, but that is something interesting, Brian. We got to really talk about. Because will there even be a Shang 2? We'll have to discuss that. Um, let us know in the comments below what you guys think, and we'll see you next time on the Nerd Report. The show goes on! Yeah!